Okay. So we just finished talking about this low, intermediate, and high temperature. Uh, somebody was asking me about the sensitivity analysis. And um, one person showed me an integrated sensitivity analysis. What I was showing you was actually just a point in time in the simulation. And when I showed you that sensitivity analysis for methylbutanoate, I don't know precisely what the fuel conversion, but I normally perform sensitivity analysis, or we do in Goway, between 10 and 20% fuel consumed, sometime, someplace in there. And if we're going to compare two fuels together, we try and compare at the same fuel conversion, what's controlling the fuel oxidation at that point of conversion, okay? Just to, to let you know, okay? So we typically look at the time to 15 or 20% fuel consumed, okay? Sorry, um, that, that, that sensitivity analysis was actually performed to ignition delay time. So what we did, as I said, what we did there was we changed uh, the ray constant by a factor of two, and we looked at the effect of that change on the ignition delay time. And then we took the original ignition delay time minus the one that we calculated over the original one times 100, and that's the percentage change in our percentage sensitivity. Okay? Oftentimes, I shouldn't have been saying sensitivity analysis. Oftentimes what we do is to look at the flux analysis, rate of production analysis, we look at between 15, 10 and 20% fuel consumed, I should say. Okay? Not for uh, sensitivity, but for flux analysis. And one thing I would say, if you are starting out with chemical kinetic models and performing chemical kinetic models, one of the most... Um, instructive things to do is to do the rate of production analysis, the reaction flux analysis of the fuel. So if you can take a particular edit, a detailed edit from Kempkin or whatever code you're using, and follow what's happening in the fuel. So look at the fuel. What are the reactions consuming the fuel? What's produced? What are the reactions consuming those? What do they produce? And follow it all the way down so that you can actually see the chemistry that's controlling the fuel reactivity. And that's very, very informative and instructive as to what's important and what, re what reactions you need to look at or to help uh, improve the mechanism. Okay. So I think most of you have seen this before. Um, it shows the, the, the explosion limits for the hydrogen-oxygen system. So if we have hydrogen-oxygen in a closed vessel, we'd say at 800 Kelvin and one bar pressure, what can happen? Hydrogen reacts with oxygen to give peroxy radical and H atom, and then the hydroperoxy radical produced reacts with hydrogen to give water and OH. Or the hydrogen atom can recombine with O2 to give, and the third body to give hydro, high, hydroperoxy radical plus and at the third body, or react with O2 to give O plus OH. Or hydrogen atom can diffuse to the wall. So here we have, an initiation step, two propagation steps, a branching step, and a termination step. And what happen, happens either between propagation, branching, and termination de determines where you are in the curve here. And you've got three distinct regions where you've got, here we have uh, no reaction, here we have reactivity. So uh, if we're at very low pressure, even up to about 1,000 Kelvin, we'd have no reaction, okay? If we go higher in pressure then, we see that we do get uh, reactivity. And then if we reach this pressure, reactivity decreases again uh, uh, through to this pressure until it starts to take off again. So what's happening across, if we're at 800 Kelvin, what's happening as we go higher in pressure, okay? So we've got three different limits the first, the second, and the third explosion limit, okay? So the first limit, okay, is sensitive to the sur surface, the vessel shape, and added inert gas. So there's a competition between branching and diffusion to the wall of H atom. So you can have a competition between H atom reacting with O2 to give O plus OH, which would give you an explosion because it's chain branching reaction, or it diffuses, H atom diffuses to the wall and you get no reactivity. So as you're very low pressure, H atom can diffuse to the wall depending on the, the surface and the vessel shape and so on, and you get 
no reactivity. Okay? We go a little bit higher in pressure, though, and H then reacts with O2 to give the O plus OH. But if we get much higher in pressure, or reasonably hi higher in pressure, H starts, this M increases, the concentration increases, and so the rate of this reaction increases relative to this one and becomes more important. And we have H plus O2 plus M then producing HO2 radical, which is a propagation reaction, not a branching reaction. And so we get less reactivity because, and this is third order. In addition to that, if you think about Le Chatelier, if we go higher in pressure, and this is even at equilibrium, as we go higher in pressure, that equilibrium shifts to the right. So it, it produces even more HO2 because we have three moles on the left and two moles on the right. Okay? So if, it, if it's approaching equilibrium, it even gets, um, shifts to higher pressure. Okay, hydroperoxy radicals are much less reactive than H and OH radicals. Okay, and again, in the third limit, the third limit is sensitive to the vessel's shape and size again. The rate is very fast. It has a higher rate of heat release and faster can be conducted, sorry, the rate of heat release is faster than can be conducted away, and therefore we get a thermal explosion in the reactor. Okay, and the added gases have an effect which is proportional to their heat transport properties okay, within the reactor. Okay, so that's just looking at the explosion limits for hydrogen. Okay, so I, I, I've been going on about this and, and when I first went to Livermore as a grad student, I just finished my first year of my PhD looking at isobutene and I went and I was doing modeling with Charlie and Bill. I remember it came to July 4th and we were heading down to the fireworks display, and Charlie was asking, well, have you learned anything in the last couple of weeks? And he said, well, if you learn nothing more than H plus O2 gives O plus OH, it's the most important reaction in combustion, you've learned a lot, okay? So I'm sharing that with you guys, okay? And so, it, but the activation energy to its formation typically is relatively high, and so, hence, uh, the, se the sequence of formation requires high temperature, and then it starts to kick in at high temperature. It's illustrated best in shock tube experiments. So here's a pretty famous plot, and it was uh, some results um, from, published by Alex Burkat and co-authors in Combustion and Flame in 1971. Okay, I think maybe you might have seen this in, in classes already. I'm not sure. But you can see here, for all the alkanes, you've got propane, butane is sandwiched in here, we've got pentane, and they all show reactivity. Okay, the activity is increasing. Sorry, I should just say here, we have inverse temperature on the x-axis, we have log ignition delay time on the y-axis, so ignition delay time is decreasing as we come down here, and it's uh, decreasing as we go from right to left, okay? So, we can see that C5 is more reactive slightly than C4 and C3, but they all show similar reactivity. But sort of the standout guy is methane. It's much less reactive at the same temperature than the other species. So you see here at inverse temperature 0.62, I don't know what that is, around 1500 Kelvin or so, you can see here that uh, butane is, I don't know, an order of magnitude or more faster to ignite than methane, okay, at the same temperature, okay? And ethane is even more reactive to ignite, okay? And so the most reactive fuel is methane, the least reactive fuel, or sorry, the most reactive fuel is ethane, the least reactive fuel is methane. And that's because um, of H atom production from the fuels. Okay? If we look at the relative, the concentrations of oxygen in these mixtures, they're typically you have about 16% oxygen in all of the mixtures. So the concentration here, and actually the concentration of fuels, okay, methane is twice the concentration uh, of fuel relative to propane. So the concentration of fuel, though, uh, doesn't change a lot among the fuels, maybe a factor of two. Um, but it's mostly, and the oxygen concentration is staying the same. So what's really dictating the reactivity is the hydrogen atom concentration. The, the more hydrogen atom produced, the faster the reactivity of the fuel. 
Okay. So it's a chain branching reaction for oxidation, not pyrolysis. The lean mixtures ignite faster than rich mixtures. Different produce, produce H atoms at different rates, and their ignition rates vary correspondingly. Okay, additives that produce H atoms will accelerate ignitions, and those that remove H atoms, slow ignition. Okay, so, so let's start looking at then at methane oxidation. And here's a sensitivity analysis to uh, methane flame speed at one atmosphere pressure and 298 Kelvin, the standard conditions. Okay, and one thing I want to point out here is that you'll see most of the reactions involve H atom, because this is a flame calculation, and so you have diffusion of H atom across the flame, okay, from the, from the reactive zone to the non-reactive zone. And you see here then, okay, again, the most important reaction uh, is H plus O2 giving us O plus OH. But also then pr producing H atom from formal radical is important. Um, the, the reaction of CO with OH giving, producing CO2 plus H is important. And you'll see all, most of these reactions, as I said, involve H atom um, in one way or another, or associated with it. Okay. okay, so if these are the reactions then controlling methane flame speed, and it's mostly, actually, you can see that the, the hydrogen oxygen CO submechanism is very important to it, then we need to have accurate ray constants for those re reactions in the mechanism. If we don't, then um, we're in trouble, and we won't predict correctly the flame speed. Okay? So where do we then get the, reaction, uh, the ray constants for these reactions? Okay? So any of these reactions that are sensitive, we want to look at them and include. One, one thing I want to point out, here we have methyl, this would be written as methane plus M giving us methyl plus H plus M. Okay? So, this would be uh, unimolecular fuel decomposition. And actually, this is inhibiting reactivity. So if we increase the rate of this reaction, it inhibits the, rate, the reactivity of the system. And again, that's counterintuitive, because surely, if we increase the rate of methane decomposition, we're going to form more methyl and more H atoms. But actually, this reaction is occurring in the reverse direction. Okay, mostly what's happening is, once the radical pool is established in the post-flame zone, H atom gets transported back. That reacts with O2 in the, the, as the, fuel, the O2 comes in to react. And we have H plus O2 giving us O plus OH being the most important chain branching reaction. Okay? And so that, this, this reaction then of H reacting with methyl radical, which is also in the system, Reproducing methane inhibits reactivity, competing with the chain branching reaction, and so it's the most inhibiting react reaction in the system. Okay? So it's actually not occurring as unimolecular fuel decomposition, it's occurring in the reverse direction, which is sort of counterintuitive, okay? Because you think there's so much fuel there that it would be producing methyl plus H. Okay, now, so, this slide then acts as a link because I showed you yesterday how using techniques like uh, shock tubes that, as Stanford do, Professor Hansen's group there does, to measure ray constants, then we've taken the ray constant measured by Professor Hansen's group for H plus O2, and we've used that in our mechanism, okay? And that's, that's what we use because that's the best known ray constant for that reaction that exists in the literature, okay? Then other reactions, I didn't point them out clearly, but other reactions that are important are this reaction OH plus HO2 giving us water plus O2. This is important, and this is um, Ray Constant again published by Professor Hansen's group at the symposium a few years ago, and this is the Ray Constant that we use. This is actually a, a, a Ray Constant derived or calculated by Mike Burke at Argonne Labs, and it's very similar these calculations very similar to what was measured at Stanford, okay? For HO2 plus HO2 recombination to give hydrogen peroxide plus O2, we use this uh, ray constant here, which is a Kaplan et al. fit. This is actually uh, 
again, measured ray constants by uh, Professor Hansen's group at Stanford. And it's just showing you how we analyze the, our, in the community, people have analyzed these ray constants and uh, how, um, what they look like. So the ray constant decreases with temperature and then increases rapidly again. So oftentimes, actually, for this ray constant, it would be entered as two ray constants, the sum of two ray constants. So we would have one ray constant in this temperature regime, ranging from about 900 up to 2,000 Kelvin, and then a second ray constant to, to, for this range from, I don't know, 250 Kelvin up to 900 to 1,000 Kelvin. Okay. Another reaction that's important is O atom reacting with water, giving you hydroxy radical radicals. Okay. And then one of the other reaction that I had pointed out earlier, CO plus OH giving you CO2 plus H. Professor Wong, Hai Wong, um, looked at this in the mid uh, noughties and he came up with this uh, fit. And you can just see here, this is a close up of this area here on the graph uh, for this reaction. And again, it's the sum of two ray constant expressions here. So we have a low temperature version and we have a high temperature version here. So here's the low temperature uh, part of the curve here, the expre this expression, and it's the sum of the two which defines the ray constant over the complete range. So you can see how they, they're idiosyncratic. They, they look very strange and very different from one another, the ray constants. And hence, we have to be very careful. We can't draw analogies. They have to be calculated or measured uh, carefully. Okay. So other reactions um, that are important are, are this formal radical reacting with the third body to give hydrogen atom plus CO plus M, or formal reacting, radical reacting with O2 to give so, CO plus HO2. In this, this reaction, if, if formal radical reacts with O2, we, we generate carbon monoxide plus HO2, and we don't get H atoms. And H atoms then are not free to react with O2 to give O plus OH. And hence, if this reaction is enhanced relative to this one, then the, the system's reactivity decreases. Okay? The flame speed um, gets longer. Okay? That's what we observe. Okay? And then, again, there's, there's quite a bit of uncertainty, maybe within a factor of two uncertainty in these ray constants. And again, the relative rates then, that factor of two uncertainty in either, either one leads to a factor of four altogether, and you have to then choose what ray constant you use for either one to best fit with the data that you have. Unfortunately, we're still down to that at the end of the day. Okay? So, yes, we, we're using the best we can, but there is still some uncertainty in the ray constants, and that's what we have to use. But you need to know what ray constants um, to use and what uncertainty exists. Okay? And, and go through in detail each one. Okay? But you have to decide, first of all, which are the reactions that are controlling the system and what the system is sensitive to. Okay? So what we use is this rate constant that, which was measured. Uh, this one is from um, David Gutman's group and the Catholic University in Washington. That's where, um, it was published in uh, the 80s, as far as I know. And these are data measured by uh, Desane and um, Craig Tages at Sandia Labs fairly recently in the last number of years. And I asked Craig, you know, could these be, could there be a factor of two uncertainty in these? Because he, they measured here as a function of temperature. And you can see as a function of temperature, there's really no, they didn't see any temperature dependence. We have some temperature dependence here. So it, it's increasing by a factor of two or three, uh, going from um, 200 Kelvin up to, uh, I don't know what that is, maybe 1,000 or so. OK. All right. OK. But here, and then you see here, there's many orders of magnitude. There's, there's um, I don't know, 13 orders of magnitude on that axis. OK. 
But you can see, I just want to point out, there's this solid line, which is the ray constant that we use for formal radical decomposition, and this dot dashed line, this is about a 30% difference in ray constant across the range, okay? So it's not a huge difference. And again, we fit quite well the Timonen data, which are, are agree, pretty, we go through the Timonen data uh, that, that were measured by David Gutman's group, okay? And here's the ray constant that we use. Now, why am I going on about these? HCO plus M and HCO plus O2. Because again, as I said, if you, a little change in one relative to the other is going to make a big difference in reactivity. HCO decomposing to give H plus CO will enhance reactivity. HCO reacting with O2 will decrease reactivity. And we have to be careful about that, okay? But, so I, I showed you the sensitivity plot here for, for those two, and this is to methane flame speed. But these two reactions are actually even more sensitive to, uh, or sorry, methanol flame speed is even more sensitive to both of them. And so again, for methanol flame speed, we see H plus O2 giving us O plus OH is the most important reaction. But now formal rad radical is almost, radical decomposition is almost as important as H plus O2. And again, formal radical reacting with O2 giving CO plus HO2 is um, the most important reaction inhibiting reactivity, okay? So, so your choice of ray constants, as I said, the relative rates are important, right? Now, another thing that I wanted to point out, here are some data and for methanol flame speed. And there's one thing to say that when it comes to maybe modeling hydrogen um, oxidation, there's quite a lot of data in the literature. And for methane, there's quite a lot of data too. But then when you start getting to other fuels, like methanol or any others, there's very little data, or the data is sparse, in which to validate a mechanism against. So if, if you guys are familiar with um, developing models and, and simulating data and hydrocarbon data, you'll know that for methane, there's, there's I don't know, 30, 30 data sets or 20 data sets for methane flame speed at one atmosphere and 298 Kelvin. But here we only have two data sets. This Velu is from, um, his name, um, uh, Foki and Agafopoulos' group in University uh, USC. And here's Van Coley. I think this is uh, Alexander Konoff's group. He's now at Lund University. And you can see under lean conditions, the flame speeds tend to agree with one another. But on the rich side here, at uh, equivalence ratio of 1.5, the VALU data is slower, considerably slower, than the Van Coyle data, okay? And the mechanism that we produced um, agrees, I would say, with the VALU data, we'd say, on the lean side, and Van Coyle's data here on the rich side. Okay, so there is some uncertainty here. But anyway, just if we change some of the ray constants. So if we take Jir uh, Aramco Mech, okay, and we use the, the ray constant that's in the Lee et al mechanism. So this is a mechanism here from Princeton from Professor Dreyer's group, the ray constant. And the ray constant in Lee's mechanism is this dash that line, this 30% slower, okay? then the flame speed becomes slower, okay? So that's how sensitive the flame speed is to that one ray constant in the mechanism. That's just a 30% decrease in that HCO decomposition reaction, okay? So, so we're using, we use the slightly higher one in our mechanism, okay? But if we use uh, Lee's the HCO plus M in a Ramco mech, and then also use Lee's methanol plus OH given methoxy plus water rate constant, we get this um, plot here, or this line here, the dash la that line. So one of those comp compensates for the other, right? And you end up with the same prediction, okay? So now the question is then, well, 
is this ray con what, what about this ray constant? And is that reasonable? Now, don't get me wrong on this. I'm not trying to pick on Professor Dreyer's mechanism or our mechanism. I'm trying to share with you my experience on how to derive a mechanism and how we, we go about our reasoning as to what the ray constant should be and so on. All right? So if we look at now methanol plus OH then, we have we can abstract the, the alcohol, al alcoholic hydrogen atom or one of the methylene hydrogen atoms, okay? Giving two different radicals in water. And here's data that existed in the literature from, for the, the total rate of methanol plus OH. And then this would be a calculation, uh, a fit from ab initio calculations by Zhu and Lin, where they calculated the rate constant, which agrees pretty well with the data, you would say. I, you would agree. And also, though, some um, empirical analysis by Bott and Cohen, which also agrees quite well. It's slightly faster at, higher or at lower temperature, I should say, and then slower at higher temperature. But both of them, you would say, reasonable agreement with experimental data. OK. However, they have different branching ratios for the two reactions. OK. So at lower temperature, they're about the same. But then Bott and Cohen, when you get to about 2,000 Kelvin, suggest that their, their reaction, abstraction of the alcohol hydrogen atom, the alkoxy, producing a methoxy plus water, is about 50% of the reaction flux. And 50% occurs on the methylene side. OK? Whereas Zhu and Lin say that CH2OH, there isn't much temperature dependence of the branching ratio. And that even at a 2000, or 2,000 Kelvin, over 90% of the flux, uh, our abstraction occurs on the methylene side. OK? So which is right or which is reasonable? OK? And so what we then did was we said, right, let's look and say, here's, here's a plot of ray constant versus inverse temperature for forming alkoxy radical plus water, OK? Just taken in from the literature for different alcohols. But I would I hope you would agree that, look, if we abstract from methanol or we abstract from m-butanol, the, the relative bond association energy, the bond strength of that hydrogen atom won't change very much. And the rate constant from one alcohol to the other should be about the same. And here are all the calculations. So all the calculations are about 2 times 10 to the 12, you know, in this 1 to 2 or whatever it is across the range. OK? But you see that this ray constant um, recommended by Bott and Cohen is probably, I don't know, what's this, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's about a factor of 4 too fast. OK? So it, it seems to suggest that this is a factor of 4 too fast. So the ray constant then that's in the Lee mechanism for methanol plus OH is probably a factor of four too fast. OK? And hence, we, because of the sensitivity of the formal HCO plus M giving you H plus CO plus M reaction in this system in particular, but to all flame speeds, we sort of pinned it using this methanol flame speed. And we used it, and it's only 30% faster than what's in the Lee mechanism, OK? But it, and so it's still within the uncertainty. And it's hard to tell who's right or whatever. But it's helping us isolate what that rate constant should be for that reaction. And it's still reasonable within what's been measured experimentally and so on. So you have to do this kind of analysis and try and optimize as best you can. And one thing I would say, maybe hopefully later today, is that this is exactly what um, Professor uh, Thomas Turiani is doing at uh, Budapest, in Othfuss University in Budapest, where he's using a computer to optimize a mechanism, setting bounds for the, the uncertainty and the ray constants, and then optimize, allowing the mechanism to optimize it, itself. Okay? And I think definitely that's the way of the future. 
Other, other groups are doing it too. Hai Wang actually was one of the first to do, start doing this, where he was optimizing just the frequency factor of a ray constant. Um, whereas um, in Thomas Dariani's group uh, in Budapest, they optimize all three parameters. And that's better because then you're optimizing the whole ray constant across a wide range. If you optimize only the frequency factor, then your mechanism will only be valid within a narrow temperature range because you're not changing the activation energy and so on. Okay? So I hope, uh, as just a, a few sm small examples of, of the sort of analysis that we do. And hence, we now arrive at a ray constant then for HCO plus M, giving us HCO pl uh, H plus CO plus M, and then the HCO plus O2. That's how we came to uh, fix the ray constants for those reactions that we use in our mechanism now. Okay? What about then uh, methyl plus H plus M giving us methane plus M? Okay? The solid lines here are what we use in a Ramco MEG. And I don't know where the high pressure limit has gone. Here it is, I guess. Okay? And it varies a little bit with temperature. And it's a bit lower than what's recommended by Stephen Klippenstein by about a factor of two. It's calculated by Stephen Klippenstein. But here we see the, the pressure dependence in GRI MEC, and it's very similar at low pressures, but we're actually lower at higher uh, pressures. Okay? And that, that's important because if we look at then methane flame speed at an initial temperature of 298 Kelvin, but we look at it at different pr pressures. So this is one atmospheres, five atmospheres, and 10 atmospheres. You can see that, okay, a Ramco mech does pretty well, okay? But a GRI mech actually does better in, a, in many ways at the conventional one atmosphere, 298 Kelvin condition. But then if you look at higher pressures, five and 10 atmospheres, um, it's uh, too slow, okay? The mechanism's too slow. Why? Because the ray constant for methyl plus H plus M is faster in GRI mech relative to Aramco mech. Now again, I'm not saying we're right and they're wrong, but that because they're faster and we're slower, then their flame speed is slower um, in this condition. Now it may or may not be just this reaction that's causing this, but this is one of the sensitive reactions that does cause this in the system. Okay? So th that's one thing on this plot. Okay? So because that reaction is, is slower in our mechanism, relative, sorry, is, what am I saying? Our, our, our reaction, we're, um, yeah, we're slower than they are. Then our predictive flame speed is faster than GRI MEG. Okay? One last thing then, at higher pressures, I should say. And then one last thing is the dotted line. So the, the dotted line then is if we took, if we take GRI MEG and this dashed line, and then if we set all colliders in this reaction, H plus O2 plus M giving you methane plus M. You see the third body efficiencies for the different colliders. Water typically set to six or 12 or something. CO set to two or three. CO2 set to two or three. These uh, collider efficiencies of these species. A lot of those collider efficiencies are not well known. And this is one thing that Aaron Jasper, working with St uh, Jim Miller, Aaron Jasper working in Sandia and Stephen Miller, or Jim Miller is retired now, but he still works part-time in California and part-time at Argonne Labs. They're working on trying to um, back out what the collider efficiencies should be for these reactions. But if we set all those collider efficiencies in GRI MEC to be one, then GRI MEC actually captures the data very well again, okay? And that's because um, if we set the collider efficiencies of these all to be one and not a higher number, then that reduces the rate of this reaction closer to what we're using, and therefore um, the reactivity is well predicted. Okay? So because having the colliders in there is enhancing the reactivity of the system, um, the 
flame speeds are, well, the flame speeds are slower when the reaction's faster. Okay. I hope that's clear. Okay. Now, I'm going to sh shift gears a little bit. So what I was talking about was sensitivity to flame speed and sensitivity to high temperature um, processes. Okay, and we see there, as I said, that the low temperature chemistry, hydrogen, CO, and C1 chemistry is very important, right? Here we're, we're looking at sensitivity to methane shock tube ignition delay time at 1250 Kelvin and 30 atmospheres. So this would be, pardon me, an intermediate, coming out of the intermediate temperature regime at, at the edge of it, but in the, still in the intermediate temperature regime at, at higher pressure. And we perform the sensitivity analysis for lean stoichiometric and rich mixtures. And you can see here now the most important reaction, increasing reactivity, is methyl plus O2 giving formaldehyde plus OH. Okay? But, and then methyl plus HO2, I spoke about this before, enhancing reactivity. And then where's the other one? Methyl plus HO2, uh, decreasing reactivity. Okay? But you see here now. Another reaction that's important is methyl peroxy radical reacting with methyl radical to giving two methoxy radicals. Okay, that's important, right? Why? Because these two methoxy radicals are going to give you hydrogen atom, and then that's going to give you high degree of re reactivity. So that increases reactivity. So increase this react. So also then we're getting methyl peroxy from methyl plus O2 giving you um, methyl peroxy. Okay, so this is one reaction I, you should consider if you are, and must be included, and it isn't in GRI NIC, and it must be included if you want to do high pressure, uh, intermediate, low temperature kinetics of methane. You have to have um, methyl plus O2 giving you methyl peroxy, and then just methyl peroxy giving you methyl, plus methyl giving you two methoxies. They're the two reactions you need to add, that's all. It's very simple, okay? But you, you can see also then that HO2 chemistry is important and CHCO2 chemistry is important. And also then methyl plus methyl re self re recombination. So I showed you the slide a little bit earlier which showed you the oxidation mechanism for methane and the pyrolysis mechanism for methane. And here you can see the two, the competition in action, okay? Methyl re radical reacting with O2 giving formaldehyde plus OH. Formaldehyde is going to go on to be oxidized to formal, which will give you H and CO, and the CO will react to give you a high, high heat release eventually. So this reaction is, will increase reactivity, whereas the self-reaction, self-recombination of the two methyls, a termination reaction uh, inhibits reactivity. Um, very obvious, okay? And then self-recombination of HO2 giving you H2O2 plus O2, inhibiting reactivity. Whereas HO2 reacting with the fuel to give methoxy plus OH enhances reactivity. So you can see how one is offsetting the other, one competes with the other, and so you have to have the relative rates of all of these um, in there, and uh, it's important. Okay, so let's look at this system. So how do we produce methyl peroxy? As I said, Methyl reacts with O2 and the third body to give methyl peroxy radical, or it can also, at high temperature, react with O2 to give either formaldehyde plus OH or uh, methoxy plus O. Okay? And let's just look at the low temperature one first. Okay. So if we look at the sensitivity of an ignition delay time to thermochemistry at 900 Kelvin and 20 atmospheres, here we see that it's very sensitive to the entropy of CH3O2. Well, it's sensitive to the heat of formation of methyl, the entropy of O2, and the, you know, the, it's sensitive to all the thermodynamic parameters, essentially. But it's highly sensitive to the, the entropy of CH3O2. Now, we would hope that the, the thermodynamic parameters of methyl and O2 would be well known, okay? And so most of our uncertainty would be in the thermochemistry of CH3O2, okay? So when we looked at this and we had some issues when we were developing our mechanism, we, we, we checked what we were using from 
term and what was best available at the time. And here's the heat of formation that we were using and the entropy at 298 Kelvin. Okay, and then I asked Professor Simi at Galway to calculate as best he could using the, high, the best method. He's using isodesmic reactions and so on. And he calculated the heat of formation to be 2.92. Now his entropy calculation was very similar to what we were using. It was only 0.14 uh, calories per degree Kelvin per mole different, which would make very little difference in the frequency factor. But the, uh, he, the, the heat of formation was actually 0.7 kilocalories per mole higher, okay? Now, if we think about that, okay, we know the heat of formation of methyl, this is zero, and then CH3O2, if that increases, the heat of formation of CH3, the heat of formation of this increases by 0.7 kilocalories per mole. What happens to this equilibrium? goes to the left, okay? We get less CH3O2 produced, okay? So that will go to the left. And if that goes to the left, we get a lower concentration of CH3O2, then the rate of this reaction will decrease because the concentration of CH3O2 decreases, okay? So again, it's a, it's a small example. It's very simple, right? But it's pointing out the importance of the thermochemistry of the species, right? And so, you know, I, you do the best you can, you've got this, but it does matter, and it matters a lot to the predictions. And again, tomorrow I'll show you, or Friday, I'll show you, it matters a lot, okay? And it's very important that you've got good thermochemistry, okay? So if that happens then, this is what happens if you change it, okay? So here was the original mechanism, and then if we use 0.7 kilocalories per mole difference in the heat of formation, the rig, the reactivity of the system decreases by a factor of two, okay? And this is important, actually. We, we published just recently a paper on methane DME mixtures, and this is an important um, part of the improving the mechanism for the, particularly the methane, uh, the mixtures with high methane concentration to get the reactivity correct, was actually correcting the heat of formation of CH3O2. Okay, so they're important. Okay, now the other two reactions that I spoke about, and then we'll take a break, were, was actually then at high, t at high temperature, um, we have methyl, I'm, I'm just, my brain is, is think, there's a, a plot over here and I'd like to use it. Okay, so if we think, th this is a bit different, I just, somebody was asking me a question. Okay, if we make this methyl, okay, at, we have methyl reacting with O2, okay, and it can collide with a third body and fall into the well, okay? The more third body that exists, in other words, the higher the pressure, the more CH3 plus O2 will react with itself and fall into the well and generate CH3. O2, okay? But if you're at lower pressure, right, when CH3 plus O2 collide with the third body, they get energy. You get chemically activated CH3O2, okay? So up here, you have chemically activated CH3O2, okay? And you hear about fall off with pressure or whatever, and so, at, this can cascade down, losing its energy, forming stable CH3O2. Or it can go on to form CH3O plus O or formaldehyde plus OH, okay? So if you're at high pressure and relatively low temperature, all of, most of the CH3 or all of the CH3O2, depending on the condition, CH, this excited CH3O2 stabilizes to form stable CH3O2. But if you're at higher te high temperature and low pressure, that chemically activated CH3O2 goes on and forms methoxy plus O or formaldehyde plus OH. Okay? 
And so here's the, here are ray constants that are taken then from the literature. And just to say that there were, sorry, there were two, two papers published in the literature. Uh, no, I hope I get this right. Okay, the Srin, Srinivasan, I think the Srinivasan was from, work was from Joe Michael's group at Argonne Labs. And the Herbon um, measurement was from um, Professor Hansen's group at Stanford. And they published ray constants for these two reactions in the mid noughties And they were published within about six months of one another. But you can see that the, the ray constants here differ by a factor of three or four. Now at high temperature, at 2,000 Kelvin, they merge, but this reaction is important here at 1,000 Kelvin. You can see here, they still differ by about a factor of two or three, okay, in ray constant, okay? And then other ray constants that exist in, the, in mechanisms for this reaction are provided here, with the fastest one being USC MEC2 from Hai Wang's group, okay? Now, here then are ray constants that are in the literature or in mechanisms for this reaction, formaldehyde plus OH, okay? And again, this is the measured value from Stanford, and this is a measured value from Joe Michael's group at Argonne Labs, and you can see that they differ here by about a factor of seven. And actually, if we compare the relative rates, the relative rates in predict are calculated or measured by Herbon and sorry, by Joe Michael, sorry, Stanford's group and Joe Michael's group um, are faster for formaldehyde plus OH than they are for methoxy plus O. So this is the dominant pathway predicted, or calculated by them, or measured by them, I should say. And then, but because of this difference, and actually I was, I was trying to do, optimize a mechanism, and I met them both on a boat when we were on the picnic at Heidelberg. And I said to them, look, I said, you know, there's a problem. Both of you have published, this is 2006, they had just come out in the literature maybe a few months prior to that or whatever it was. And I said, there's a problem because both of you have measured these ray constants, but they differ by whatever it is from one another. I don't know precisely. I think it's about factor seven here in this one. And this one is the important one, the dominant one that they measured. And they said, well, one of them said to me, well, you should use one or the other because one of us is right and the other is wrong. Yeah. And, I, and I said, well, I'm not using one or the other. I'm using a compromise. And they said, no, 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 you shouldn't do that, right? But actually, I did because I had to, taking other ray constants that existed and so on, and optimizing over a wide range of data for methane, I used a compromised ray constant. And actually, what I used was something close to what Herbon, Herbon had measured, but faster, okay? And I, I, I'm using, actually, I was using one within 30% of this black one. Now, this black one has actually never been published, but it was one at, on the same uh, boat, I was talking with Stephen Klippenstein, and I said, look, could you calculate this ray constant for us? Because it's very important. So he did. He gave me the ray constant, but he actually has never published it. And this is the calculation that he provided to me. And that's what we use in the mechanism, okay? But I think actually it's, well, of course this is what we use, so I think it's, it's the best that, that, that's there. But I actually think it's, it's closer to the truth than the others. Now, there's, there's one, so I'm not sure why, but it's certainly closer to the Stanford number. And what, when, when, um, particularly in Stanford, when they're doing experiments, they try to pick conditions for which the, the experiment that they're performing is only, the result of which is only sensitive to the reaction that they're looking at. And perhaps in this case, they had some sensitivity that they weren't quite aware of to another reaction, like maybe methyl plus HO2, for instance. They might have been getting a little bit of HO2 in there, and it may have put off the, the measurement that they measured slightly. I don't know. It's only one, it's only my own thinking. You'd have to talk to them to see. And they could say I'm completely wrong, right? But anyway, 
taking best fit against lots of data for methane, I come up with a rate constant. And actually, using this one is a pretty good fit within the mechanism, taking all, all the other rate constants into consideration. And that's what we use. Okay. One, one last thing I wanted to show is that if you look at the branching ratio, so um, these solid lines are the, 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 the reaction channel going to formaldehyde plus OH, and this, these dashed ones are the channel going to methoxy plus O. Most of the mechanisms uh, have the formaldehyde plus o to OH route dominating. But um, which is it? The USC mech here has them crossing here at about 1400 Kelvin, where the, the root form of methoxy plus O dominates. And GRI mech is similar as well. Okay? But most of the others have the formaldehyde plus OH root dominating. Okay? Um, just to, anyway, let's take a break at that, and we'll come back at 10 past 11, and we'll continue. Okay? Thanks. <laughs>